my talks in the land which I had chosen from the beginning. Because I have a feeling that a certain number of people are troubled by the kind of approach to the faith and to ourselves which I have suggested. I have received re recently from Russia a certain number of letters saying that I'm not an orthodox in my teaching. That what I say is either simply heretical or not thought out. And yet, I want to share with you the way in which I think what I have come to believe to be true in the course of many years of life. There was a time when I clung to the letter passionately. And then gradually, I began to discover that the letter is only an approximation, an attempt at conveying to us things which are far beyond the letter and the speech. There is a passage in St. Paul in which he says that we see things as though we are looking through a dark glass. This corresponds to what I have said several times in the last talks, that we are in a twilight. The things are real, but we do not always see them, we cannot always see them as they really are. And I would like to come back to this point because it is important for us if we want to grow in spirit to be more and more God's friends and companions to have both humility and daring. What St. Paul has said I have translated by saying that we live in a twilight between the glorious light of the beginning of creation when nothing, no shadow had yet come between God and us, when there was no darkness, when everything was light and translucent. And then we, well, we are waiting for a time when all things will be fulfilled and when the light will shine with perfect fullness, with perfect clarity, when God shall be all in all. Do we realize what it means? all in all. It doesn't mean that he will be present everywhere only. It means that everything will be pervaded with his divine presence. To a certain degree, very really, but in a way which we do not always perceive. We have an an approximation of this experience in the Holy Liturgy. A thing that has struck me once to the heart and has remained with me and which I come back to every time the liturgy is celebrated is that when the consecration takes place, the bread and wine became 
the body and blood of Christ. In a sense which we do not always understand rightly or understand at all. Shall I say that I'm nearer, nearer to not understanding at all? <clears throat> but I would like to share with you what I perceived then. The grace of the Holy Spirit descends upon this bread and upon this wine. and transforms them not into flesh and blood but into the body and blood of Christ. When we look at this consecrated bread we see a minute particle of created world which is already filled with divinity has attained the fullness of vocation and when we receive communion to this bread and wine to this body and blood of Christ we partake to the redeemed creation already there in the same way in which the fullness of God was present in the incarnate Son of God become the Son of Man. There are moments like these when in the twilight we can perceive already the glorious light. And if we think of the nature of the church, we must remember that the church is a body equally and simultaneously human and divine. It is human in us with all the frailty, all the imperfection, the unfulfilled condition which is ours, but it's also divine because one man in the church is the Lord Jesus Christ. In him we can see humanity perfect, fulfilled, united with the Father and filled with the Spirit. And together with the Son, the Father is present and the Spirit breathes upon us. So that in a sense, already now, although we are too blind very often to see it clearly, the light is dawning has dawned and is spreading more and more. It is not every one of us who can perceive it. It is not always as radiant and clear at one moment as it is at another moment. But the light which we are waiting for, the moment where God shall be all in all, is, has already been kindled by the incarnation and the scent of the Holy Spirit. We live in a world in which the twilight is not simply lack of the primeval, original light of creation, the light which is in the world is already the light of fulfillment, 
the divine presence, the presence of God, longed for, made real, and received by the believers. The twilight in which we live in that sense is not an absence of light. It's a gradual growth towards it, into it, or rather, it is a light that gradually pervades us in all things. And yet, when we want to speak of these things, we haven't got the right words. We haven't got the right words because we cannot express in the language of the fallen world the mysteries or the condition of the world before the fall. We use words where one should use contemplative silence. I will try to convey that to you in a way. When we speak of things divine, we try to understand with our mind. We try to understand making, taking advantage of the frail, imperfect experience which we have. But in the beginning, both the experience and the understanding were deeper and vaster. We can have an approximation to understanding by hearing what, for instance, St. Gregory Palamas says about the condition of the angels. He calls them Ftarie Svetici, second lights. Not in the sense that they are below, but he goes on to explain that they are totally open to God, totally transparent to him, and that the light of God, which flows from him, pervades them, fills them, so that they shine with light divine, nothing less. This light is not their own. It is God's. And yet, they are filled with it, pervaded by it. This is the way in which we should know God. This is the way in which we should know all things. But with the fall, there is a degree of knowledge of communion which we still possess. And there is also a greater degree, alas, of lack of understanding. The twilight. And when we try to express things, we must be aware of what we are doing. So continuously, we hear particularly in the Protestant churches, but also in our own, that the Bible, the Gospel, is the Word of God. Yes, it is the Word of God. God is revealing in the Scriptures such things which we could not ourselves have discovered and understood. But we understand these things to the extent to which we are ourselves enlightened by the light of God. The angels who are light divine, received, not possessed, 
but received and lived by can understand a great deal more than we do because it is not in words and by words that they capture their knowledge and their understanding or express it. When we think of the beginnings of Genesis, we find there expressed in the language of the fallen world the events of a world that was totally in God and knew nothing of alienation to him. So how can we reach out and understand it? We can reach out by communing with God and receiving from him the understanding which we cannot create ourselves. And then we must also remember that we use words and that these words vary from one time to another, from one nation to another, from one generation to another. I have given you once an example that seemed to be very crude, but very realistic. When the gospel was first translated for Laplanders, a difficulty was found by the translator. They had no lambs in Lapland. And the passage that said, the Lamb of God, they translated by using the name of a local little animal because it had to convey the meaning because Christ was not a lamb in the zoological sense of the word. And so the same thought could be expressed in a different way. Also, the meaning of words change. And very often, we do not understand a passage from the scriptures, and we remain in the darkness instead of growing out into the light by this lack of understanding. I would like to give you a couple of examples. There is a passage in the Gospel in which you are told that no one who does not hate father and mother and those who are of his blood cannot be a follower of Christ. The phrase is monstrous because we put into it the meaning of our time. But if you take ancient languages, I, I, I'm rather ignorant of them by now, but I have a certain knowledge of Russian. It says, Ashikto ne vas nienavidit. Nowadays, nienavidit means hate, actively, positively. But originally, it meant turn his gaze away, not look towards. And then, the phrase acquires a quite different meaning. If anyone who has to choose between looking at God or looking at his nearest and dearest cannot follow Christ, one must wholeheartedly look Godwards and only by communing with God who loves those whom we leave behind, can we unite ourselves with him and discover that we are one 
also with them. Another word which is a stumbling block, I believe, is the word love. We all know what romantic love is. We know how we use this term. Because, but when we think of what it is in essence, to love means so to appreciate a person or, or people as to be prepared to forget oneself completely up to the readiness of giving one's life for them. This is the way in which God loved us. He created us for us to enter into the fullness of his own life. And he knew that we would fall away from it. And he gave his only begotten son to die for us to find our way. So that to love means a total respect, evaluation of the other person to the point of being ready to give one's life. And there is in St. Gregory the Great a passage concerning God himself, which perhaps can help us understand or make us understand better. He says that how can we understand the Holy Trinity? What does it tell us about plenitude of life and death? He said God could not be an arithmetic one, a unit, because it would mean that he can love only himself. He could not be either a couple because a couple would exchange mutual love and remain alien to all the world around them. To be perfect love, God must be in three persons. But at that moment, tragedy comes into it in order that two of them could love one another totally, perfectly, the third one must accept to step out, as it were, to die, to go into non-existence, for the two to be face to face without hindrance, without intrusion. This applies, of course, to each person of the Trinity. It is not only one of them who is the sacrificial victim. Each of them steps out ready not to be for others to be fulfilled. I don't know how to explain it or to ex present it in a meaningful way. Reflect on it. Think of what it would mean if three of you, father, mother, and child, or friends, chose to secure the plenitude of communion of two by stepping out and then being recovered, recaptured, drawn back into this plenitude by the love of others. 
so that in the twilight in which we live, we have got great difficulties in understanding what the scriptures tell us about the world of God before the fall. But also, we find it very difficult at times to understand the world in which we live. And even more, perhaps, the statements which are made about God, about the Church. Because they are made with words that belong to a fallen world while we speak of those who are beyond the fall. Isn't there a way then in which we can understand? Yes, there is a way. Because, as I said time and again, you must be tired of it, we live in a twilight in which the light shines in the darkness. The light. And it is only by communion with the light that we can understand the approximations to which we come in words. No one understands what love is unless he has experienced it. No one can understand what the gift of self can signify unless it has seen it and acted, lived through. It is only by experience that we can understand the meaning of words. And when we say that the scriptures are the word of God, yes, they are. But before we can understand them, we must grow into communion with God himself, not with a dictionary, not simply search the meaning of words, but search the heart from which they come and the heart into which they fall, that is our own heart. In that sense, all that is written in the scriptures may be totally obscure for the one and clear for another. It may be obscure for me today and become luminously clear tomorrow. This depends of our communion with God, not with the text, not with words. And this is where the tragedy of the dividedness of Christians come to the fore, because it is about words which we fight. When we accuse one another of heresy, we accuse wordings. But what do we do about the person? What do we do about the way in which this particular person communes with God, lives by God, lives in God's name? It is important for us to remember simultaneously 
that there is such a thing as the truth. I do believe that the Orthodox faith, to the extent to which it can express things, is true. But I could not believe any more after many years of life that someone who does not embrace it cannot find salvation. In one of the letters which came to me two days ago, written by a monk from the Ukraine, he says, no one can be saved but an Orthodox. And what you teach is contrary to the faith, because everyone who is not an Orthodox will perish in hell. This I cannot believe. I cannot believe it because life has taught me something. I have already given this example on occasions, how during the war an officer who was not an Orthodox and I don't know whether he was a believer or not, came out of a protected corner six times to bring back into safety soldiers who had been wounded and could not crawl back. He was brought to hospital dying. In fact, he did not die, he survived. He was not an Orthodox, but didn't he manifest a, a love, a depth, a degree of love which many of us are incapable of embodying? And also, so often people cannot believe in what we believe to be true because we are to them a proof that our words are not true. When we speak of love and manifest none, when we speak of giving our lives as Christians for others and are sure that we do not give anything, can anyone believe that this is the truth? So that there is a problem here, or rather, there is a challenge, not a problem, that we cannot say that it is enough to proclaim a truth couched in words to be within the truth. We can be within the truth only if we live it. I remember again this letter which I have mentioned to you several times and I thought when I read it, here is a man who says he is an orthodox. He is sure of entering into the kingdom of God. He is sure that everyone who is not an orthodox will perish in hell. And yet, take the end of St. Mark's Gospel. And here are the signs of the believer. They will heal the sick, restore to life the dead, etc. Against this background, can he say that he is a believer at all? I can't. I can say that with all my longing, I'm carried Godwards to the extent to which I'm capable of it. I love him. 
to a small degree, I serve him. I worship him. But I cannot say that I am a believer in the sense in which Christ puts it. And if, if that is the case, how can we judge our neighbor? I have moved away from my main theme by these remarks. But I think it's important for us to realize that in the twilight in which we live, between the light that has gone partly out with the fall and the light which is dawning by the coming of, in the coming of Christ and the end of things, we must learn to commune with God through life, through prayer, uniting ourselves with him, with all our being, and not be content with the words which we use, because they may not express what they were meant to express. And in that context, I think it is perhaps possible not only to have a more thoughtful judgment about people of other Christian denominations, but also about the pagan religions of antiquity and of our times. Because The whole humanity is possessed of glimpses of memory. And these glimpses of memory are incomplete, imperfect, confused. The Bible gives us the clearest image of it, but others give us approximations that at times are true also, however incomplete. And when we meet people of different persuasions, I think we must ask ourselves, how much in what he believes in is the truth of God. And how much is it the confusion of the established by the fall and the gradual destruction of wholeness of the experience of God in humanity? And also, how much does he live by what he believes? I think that we would be impressed to see how certain people live by what they believe, the little they believe, in a greater way than we do with the great amount which has been revealed to us. Well, I will end my talk at this point. I will come back to certain of its points in my next talk. I apologize for the confusion of what I have said. It's, it's difficult for me to put it in clear, in a clear form. But reflect on it. I have tried to give you hints Think and form your own views. Be free to think. While at the same time, you remain faithful to the teaching 
and the life of the church in prayer, in mutual love, in communion,